Jamie, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I'm really intrigued and very interested in hearing your story. So my first question for you is, could you tell me what happened? Could you tell me your story? Sure. So I was um, a serviceman before and I'm going back um, a number of years now to um, the summer of 2007. And I'd been um, with the, um, the armed forces, UK armed forces for about seven and a half years. And up until that point, you know, I was, um, you know, a young guy, so to speak, just kind of getting on with my life. How old were you? So um, up until that point in, in the summer of 2007, I'd just turned 32. And, um, and I was getting on with my life and everything was going um, swimmingly well. And I had, um, I had an underlying ambition as well, and that was to, to learn to fly. And it, would, it, would, it had been an ambition of mine for some years, and that kind of went way back in time. Um, and so I decided to, uh, to not just, uh, talk the talk and decided to sort of walk the walk and prepare myself and, um, make plans to, to go somewhere where I could kind of achieve that in a relatively short window. I gave myself a couple of months over the, over the, uh, the summer of 2007 and I was out in Florida in the USA and I went there because the prospect of better weather and getting the flying done in in a relatively short uh, time period and when i was out there um, in a nutshell um I, I you know i'd been um, been flying with instructors with various instructors for a period and then i went solo for for um about eight days and then finally um up until the point of the incident um, basically i had an engine fire at altitude um and it breached the fire breached the cockpit and I managed to get the aircraft down to a, a relatively low level, a safe level. Uh, and then I um, uh, basically followed emergency protocol and the plan then was to get out onto the wing and make a jump for it. And that's what I did. That's what I managed to execute, um, albeit by the skin of my teeth. And let's just say the damage was done. So I was um, a very large uh, third degree burn from the incident, I was 63% third degree burns officially, uh, as well as some facial trauma from a secondary impact with some fractures to the front of my face and also some, uh, some internal injuries again from a secondary impact from, from the aspect of the jump. Um, so I caused some internal um, hemorrhaging and, uh, and bleeding internally. So a lot going on. And then I was hospitalized, so I airlifted from the scene very quickly, probably within uh, about a 15 minute window. So extremely uh, lucky to get airlifted by helicopter. I got extremely high level um, acute medical care in Florida uh, at one of the, the leading um, private medical establishments in the USA. And, um, and I was placed subsequently in a drug induced coma for um, a six month period. Now, the majority of that admittedly was in Florida, but um, after about four or five months when I was stable enough, they then flew me back across um, uh, the Atlantic and they took me uh, at that point to the Central Burns Unit in the UK. And um, at which point I, I carried on my treatment under the, the, um, the care of the NHS. Uh, so I was at, uh, then at um, Chelmsford Hospital or the Broomfield Hospital Chelmsford in Essex on this UK Central Burns Unit. And then I then spent um, a further, for the record, it was about, um, I think, 15, 16 months at Stoke Mandeville in Aylesbury on the Burns Unit there, still under the NHS and, and a different um, consultant for Burns and Plastics. So a very long road, approximately two years of my life, and uh, about 63 surgeries under general anaesthetic as well. Uh, but eventually, uh, um, you know, I guess with the right will and determination um, I, and, and a lot of help from the medical professionals along the way, um, I was able to pull through and um, and sort of, uh, you know, get get to the other side of that, as it were, and, and, and come back to sort of active, active, a level of active health and, and normality and, um, and then be able to share the tale. So that, that's me, really. I've got a, a lot of interest in trauma and one of the things that I'm very interested in from hearing your story is the beliefs that you had at the time when you were fighting to save your life in that situation. Do you remember what went through your mind at the time and, and what you believed was going to happen? I mean, yeah, I mean, initially, I think it's probably worth 
you know exploring just briefly on on the on the day of the incident so um initially when it had happened and i'd literally you know sort of exited the you know made the jump and exited from the wing of the aircraft i landed um and you know i'd, I'd rolled around initially to, you know smothered, smothered some flame and i knew instantly you know the level of of trauma that i faced and um and you have memory of rolling around fully conscious uh, memories of of everything that happened on the on the day itself um you know i remember everything sort of perfectly and implicitly up until the point where they airlifted me to the hospital and then of course because of the level of of uh, trauma and suffering that i was going through they um, they didn't hang about they they the medics then decided to put me under in drug induced coma to to help me and to alleviate that um that uh, that difficulty that I was having, and um, so yeah, I remember everything in the immediate aftermath um, of you know the event and the immediate aftermath itself on the ground, and having just been significantly burned, I remember you know the 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 sheer weight of trauma that my body had sustained, and and therefore what I was up against. I was under no illusion what I was up against, and. Um, and I immediately thought, with that in mind, there's no chance I'm going to make this. And um, and I also had a greater understanding of what that meant because I was actually I actually specialised with my role within the armed forces. I actually specialised as um, as a medic, as a sort of a specialist uh, patrol medic. And um, and so I had a formerly a higher level of sort of medical training, um, and um, I you know I'd even done. Um, you know, some training with the, the NHS in the UK before all of this. So I understood uh, figuratively what it meant for um, for what I was up against at the time in, in Florida with, with that injury that I described in terms of the the level of trauma that I, that I faced and and the and the the, uh, the magnitude of the burns and, and, and what that meant for me as a human being at the time. And I didn't believe that I was going to make it. I find that very interesting when people have had an experience where they absolutely believe 100% I'm going to die and then they don't. So I, I'm kind of curious as part of your story to like find out about what it meant for you having that belief at one moment in your life and then coming to the realization that actually I've survived. If I then roll forwards in the, in the, in the narrative of my story, if you will, um, and then I literally, the next real conscious memory I've got, I mean, having initially, you know, spoken to doctors, having been airlifted in Florida, and then not remembering literally anything for, the, you know, six months of my life. So the next conscious um, sort of cognitive memories that I have would be waking up in, in Chelmsford uh, and, you know, having been out of it for so long, albeit drug induced. This wasn't a traumatic brain injury, but I was drug induced. So I didn't really have too much of a clue what was going on and and um and then the realization of like you alluded to just then you know actually my god i've survived here and um you know i i was shocked really initially that um i was still here you know in 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 flesh and blood as it were and that um not only did i have to accept the the physical aspect of what 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 I'd been through, what had happened to me and what my body was still up against. Because remember, I was then, as I described at the beginning, you know, I was still in hospital for another year and a half, tremendously long time. So two years of your life as an inpatient in the hospital system between the US and the UK. And I didn't, you know, I had to accept that in the physical sense. I had to accept that in the, um, in the um, psychological sense. And that was a very tall order for me uh, to accept all of that, given the given the gravity of of my injury, having been indeed sixty three percent third degree burns according to medical diagnosis. Um, a tremendous, uh, you know, level of acceptance that um, has to come with that, and that didn't come overnight. Yeah, tell me about the psychological journey. So it was interesting. I mean, I. I yeah, at first, I, you know, I thought, okay, well, I dealt with it, I guess, quite rationally and matter-of-factly, 
you know, that I felt, okay, well, this has happened. There's nothing I can do. I knew that it was many months on now because I've indeed I'd been in the drug induced um, coma and all that was explained to me by doctors, medics, uh, if you like, they'd helped me to fill the blanks. So that, that helped to understand at least um, where I was, but uh, you know, so initially I, I would say that I adopted it with quite a pragmatic approach. Okay. This has happened to me and I can't do anything about it. I can't change anything. So I need to deal with it and I need to, to try to manage it. And I felt for all intents and purposes that I was doing exactly that. And that I was coping quite well for, you know, I, and I think I was probably fighting quite well for a, probably about another year. Um, so, but bearing in mind, I'm still in the hospital. So I'm now about 18 month point post injury, post that incident that I described in the burns. And I'm about 18 months down the road and I, and I started to kind of lose the will really. And, um, and I was struggling with it all. And, um, and, and yeah. Um, and that's when it kind of grew quite dark for me really. And, um, and, and I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to, to really go on and, and sort of fight through all of that. Were you experiencing depression at that point? Yeah, undoubtedly. So, but interestingly, you'd think that I'd have been depressed from day one, right? When I woke up, now, don't get me wrong, it was deeply harrowing on day one when it happened to me. And quite frankly, if someone had given me the alternative to sort of exit planet Earth at that point, I figuratively, you know, would have pressed a button and taken that option because of the, the you know, the, the damage that I was up against. And I knew that. I knew that in my, in my heart of hearts and in, in my mind. I, I knew that uh, it was absolutely devastating. Um, so I would have taken that exit option if it had been a, a realistic sort of easy exit. Um, but then I go forward again to the hospital. So I woke up in, in the hospital in England, six months on, thereabouts. And, and for that, you know, for that next year, I was doing pretty well. I was dealing with it pragmatically. I was coping and I was kind of just in the moment and, and dealing with it day by day. That's all you can do realistically sort of, hour by hour you know because it was it was it was a painful affair um you know to say the very least so i'm just dealing with it and coping but i challenge anybody that there's very few people i would suggest you know on this earth that have been through that level of of um of trauma and actually come through the other side and survived it um and and i would i would challenge anybody that you know thinks they can cope with that it's it's an extremely difficult thing, and um, and I wouldn't you know like to put a statistic on it, but you know um, only a very tiny percentage of of probably the human race would probably have perhaps the um, the I think the ability to hold on and, and come through all of that um, as it were uh, you know unscathed, and that's not just me sort of blowing my own ego and blowing my own trumpet. But, you know, I'd done some tough things in my time, but nothing uh, in comparison with, you know, the aftermath of burns. And so for me, I was coping and I was doing extremely well for about a year. And I say extremely well, but I was suffering intensely every single day and, you know, reliant on doctors, nurses, um, physiotherapists, interventional radiologists and all kinds of specialist help. And, and indeed, um, things were still kind of wearing away and gnawing away at me. And after a year after I woke up, if you like, back in England, I started to dip. And then I was offered some help um, in terms of, uh, you know, should we say medications to kind of perhaps lift me, sort of antidepressant. And I refused. I refused everything because I was already on a cocktail of, of uh, um, um, sort of annual G-sick type substances to help with the pain. And, um, and I was, and I was on sort of help, uh, you know, medications to help me sleep at night, because, again, because of the pain. Um, and I just thought, you know, I'm just going to be rattling if I, if I take any more medication. And I was worried about, you know, the damage, you know, to, 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 to my body in terms of like, you know, the, the damage to organs and things like that. If I, if I just don't, you know, if I take too much medication. So I was very mindful and I tried to choreograph things, um, in the healthiest way that I could could manage, with you know the help and support of the doctors, um, but 
but I did hit rock bottom and I chose not to go down the medication route with antidepressants and so on. I chose to deal with it naturally, which I did do. Um, but then I was offered some help in terms of, um, we say psychological and counselling. And at first, I'll be honest, I thought, no, no, I'm going to deal with this. And it's going to be, I'm going to deal with this in the same mannerism that I've dealt with everything in my life. Just kind of get through it, just crack on, just fight through. And being a former soldier, I was always quite stubborn, quite determined. And I thought, I'll deal with it. I'll just manage my own depression and my own sort of depth of turmoil. Um, but then they got to a point where I, I did struggle and I just thought maybe it would be good to speak to someone. It probably wouldn't hurt. So I did have, um, um, you know, several um, sessions with um, a, a, a psychology, a psychologist doctor within the hospital. And that helped. It was just somebody to share, you know, some of my innermost thoughts and feelings. And I guess where I was at that time, my, my, my status at that time, I was able to share that and then open up. And, and, and I felt that sharing some of that was at least somewhat cathartic and that could help me to, to, you know, to start to, to perhaps look towards the future a little bit more where I struggled to do that really. Yeah. Did you have assumptions before you went to therapy that unless this person really has understood what I've gone through, they're not going to be able to help? Um, because, you know, as you've described, your situation was very unique. Most people wouldn't have survived. And I mean, being completely honest, it's not every therapist or it's not every psychologist would actually be equipped to help someone who's been through such horrific physical trauma. It's a, yeah, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting question. And I won't deny that, uh, you know, when I first uh, sort of clapped eyes on the psychologist and, um, you know, I, I, I didn't, you know, I, I struggled to take that seriously initially. And, um, I just, my, my mind, my attitude was quite um, um, resolutely, you know, what can you possibly do uh, or say to make me feel any different given what I'm going through at this moment in time? And, you know, there's nothing you can feasibly say or do that's going to make me feel any different. And, um, and, and of course, what do you know? You know, and, and so, yeah, you're right. Um, I did question that. Um, but it took me to perhaps open up a little bit and um, I guess open up with myself, okay, first of all, and, and feel, because I knew that I was in this deep, deep sort of low and this deep, deep depression. So it took me to really open up with myself um, before I was able to, to, in essence, share and then discuss. And then with the, you know, the sharing of knowledge and the sharing of information, um, if you like, concepts could then be explored uh, in a way that would help me to kind of, you know, look ahead. And, and, and even though that wasn't an overnight process, and I want to emphasize that because in my case, it, was, it wasn't, you know, days, weeks to get well. It was months and years, in fact. But that process, um, sort of 18 months on from my, from my injury, from the Burns incident um, of, you know, actually opening up with myself and then uh, having the uh, inclination to want to reach out and discuss my situation with other medical professionals at the time. Um, indeed, it started to, uh, to, if you like, grow a seed within me, within my mind that, uh, okay, you know, there could be a future and I needed to, to perhaps that needed, you know, the process needed to help me enlighten to that, to that fact, if you will. So it sounds like you had a lot, a long time of having no hope for your future. And with that, I imagine that there was a lot of contemplation of suicide. It took me a long time, yeah, to, to develop exactly, um, you know, that, uh, that concept of hope. And, and that, is, that is absolutely fundamental. I mean, it's fundamental in every human life. And that's something I've learned very intimately. But um, for what I went through... Um, it was absolutely paramount to my um, to my whole survival and my whole progression as a human being post um, massive third degree burns was shit, you know, in, in a nutshell. Yeah. Hope. What kind of things yeah. gave you hope? So you went from having no hope and thinking, I don't have a life to look forward to. I don't have things to look forward to in the future. 
and then you started to find hope in things. So could you talk me through that process? Where did you find hope from? How did you start to think about things in a different light? Yep. Um, and it's still something that I, I guess I kind of work on is that as the new me, as the new Jamie Hull. But um, my, um, you know, my honest take on this in terms of developing hope when things are at their lowest ebb, uh, for me, it was about um, setting goals and to uh, have a realisation that, um, you know, perhaps some of the goals at first, you know, were just uh, too far reaching and too far out and they were like way out on the horizon and they weren't, they literally weren't feasible because the condition that my body was in and the fact that I was confined to a hospital bed and uh, I could, you know, I couldn't really get up. Um, I'm talking about the very early stages of my recovery. Um, and, um, and I mean, just to fill you in here and just to give you some greater understanding, you know, you know, I had to learn to walk all over again. I had to learn to feed. I had to learn to write my name and then subsequently, you know, put pen to paper and write letters and things like that because my hands were somewhat crippled because of the injury and surgery that I'd had to skin grafts on the back of my hands. So I was having to learn to do everything from pretty much day one all over again. And, um, and for me, it was about the small goals and, um, and, and trying to work that into the equation you know, that, that, that equation of this new life and how I was going to deal with it and how I was going to cope with it in a day-to-day -day basis. So, for example, you know, the process of learning to walk, um, you know, it was just about literally at first sitting up in bed and then, you know, sort of, you know, uh, literally from sitting to, to standing, you know, over the edge of the bed with the mattress kind of behind me supporting me. And then I needed the intervention of, of scrapping male physios and they put me in a bit of a harness to to be able to walk a little bit so there's a hell of a lot to my story in terms of the rebuilding process of 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 jamie and uh, and what i went through um and it must have been hard for you that you had to set such small goals because the life you lived before was about big goals like learning to fly and like really cool kind of things that you know I'm sure that the way that your mind worked was you were probably quite a high achieving person so then to have to set these small goals you must have really had to retrain your mind to accept that these were quite small goals but of course huge indeed. goals I mean, for you and and the brain fortunately you know I still had good sort of faculties I was compass mentis you know it wasn't a brain injury but nevertheless, I, I was facing a lot of, you know, depression, which we've already kind of, you know, touched on. And that fog of depression was um, very much hindering my outlook and I guess the ability to 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 motivate myself on a day to day basis. And um, and not only was it goals, but it was the case that, you need, you know, you can set goals. Anybody can set goals, but you need to have the motivation. You need to have that inner inclination and drive to want to fulfill those goals and that takes a level of determination and you've got to follow through with that um, so yeah I had to try to redevelop all of that and when the depression was at its worst you must have like physically not even been able to move to get those goals going because depression can really like weigh people down so on top of all of the physical problems just the mood stuff must have meant that even just doing the smallest of things was incredibly difficult. Indeed. So, you know, for me, you know, I might set aside, okay, 20 minutes where I'm going to, I'm going to perhaps sit up in the bed, you know, in the early stages and I'm going to try and put pen to paper and I'm going to try and pen a letter. That's literally how desperate I was in my scramble back to, as I say, normality and back to a level of, of normal kind of, health and let alone active health that came a lot for much much further down the line um so my goals were really quite sort of um tender and what i would class as real sort of infant steps in the uh in the in the early stages of my recovery and later on you know the goals um grew in in magnitude so you know it, it got brighter in terms of my my prognosis and, and my outlook thankfully and then but um you know, perhaps six months on from what I describe, and I was now back at home, and um, I was then contemplating being a little bit more physical and, you know, walking outside of, of the home. Uh, I needed walking aids, so I had um, sort of sticks initially. So I'd graduated from a from a wheelchair 
to a kind of a walking frame to to walking sticks and then eventually that went down to one walking stick um, because I had some nerve damage um, a little bit of nerve damage in my lower limb uh, which which did sort of hold me back for for a considerable period with the mobility but again those goals I was able to build upon those goals um, and at first you know to give you an indication to give you an idea um, you know I might sort of walk out in the driveway and and I might decide to walk you know the 10 yards from from door front door to the end of the driveway and then you know do a u-turn and, and come back and hey that was a, that was like a major achievement and then I, I just built on that gradually over the weeks and months, having got out of the hospital. And I was now sort of home, but albeit um, revisiting the hospital at least three times a week. And I built on those home goals domestically. And I started to do more walking, more, more kind of mobility. And then, um, um, you know, it's probably fair to say that um, I learned to kind of figuratively walk around the block at home. And then I pushed the boundaries or pushed the envelope on that um, that block, and essentially the block got bigger. And then a year later, I was actually doing eight mile kind of loops around the local area, pretty much um, seven days a week. It kind of harks back to a kind of a, a military kind of uh, ambition that I wanted to kind of do this kind of uh, distance in my mind. And I used the local area, you know, um, you know everything in quiet roads, pathways, um, some Grand Union Canal close to where I live. And um, I was able to use nature and, and again, push the boundaries on those physical walking goals. And that helped me to develop, you know, my, my outlook and, if you like, my positive, um, my psychology. What, were, what was sleeping like for you? Nightmares, flashbacks, um, all of the PTSD symptoms? Yeah, I did. Um, it's a very good question. I did think about, um, I did think about, you know, um, the incident. It used to play over and over in my mind. I mean, I still think about it from time to time. I, you know, I don't think there's probably anybody out there that that, that goes through, um, say, a life changing situation, a life changing ordeal, <clears throat> that doesn't actually think about it. You know, it still comes up in my in my in my conscious memory um but in the earlier stages i used to perhaps um flash back to that not in the sort of um necessarily the nightmarish sense but occasionally i'd perhaps wake up in a bit of a sweat because it would come up in my dream you know um i wouldn't say that it particularly haunted me because um you know i, I always felt that i dealt with it on the day and i was in relative control of the situation to 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 enable me to to, to get out of there and, and effectively sort of save my own skin. Yeah, but, um, that's a very interesting point that you've just made because in your situation, you did take control and you did everything possible to have the most positive outcome and the outcome was actually far more positive than what you thought. And in a lot of trauma cases, people are really troubled with what they could have done differently. And It's true, and I agree with that. Um, you know, the level of control on the day probably helped me with the aftermath. But what I will say is, because it happened to me, you know, you question that. And in the early stages, it's like, why me? Why me? You know, why did it happen to me? You know, it, literally in the very early stages, I'd only have to look in a mirror. And I felt sort of grief and I felt anguish about what happened to me, you know, because I was kind of scarred and, and it changed my appearance quite dramatically. And, um, and I just, you know, I, I struggled with all, with all that for a long time. And, um, but eventually, you know, the, the acceptance and everything, it does come to the fore. And um, you learn to realize that, I guess, ultimately, you know, you've still got, you know, a pretty good toolkit in terms of, you know, the body and in terms of what you can use and, and getting out there. I, I realized that I'll never be perhaps the former guy that I was. You know, I'll never be that kind of true sort of athlete that I was, but um, but I was able to to really push myself and to to get back to a level of active health that I guess that I was satisfied with, and then work with that, you know. Um, I want to ask about coming to accept how you look now, um, and as you mentioned, when you looked in the mirror, that was just something that was so difficult for you. Could you tell me a little bit about that journey? 
Yeah, sure. So that was one of the very first things I remember being in the hospital. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I looked, um, <laughs> you know, I'd like to say, um, you know, um, by my own admission, I guess, um, that I, I do feel that I look a whole lot better now than what I did back then. I mean, that was, um, you know, um, sort of 12 and a half years ago now when I kind of was, if you like, um, awoken in the hospital. This is back in England, um, having been in the States, remember. And, um, and one of the very first things, one of the first memories I have is that the nurse passed me a mirror and she said, you know, we need to, you need you to have a look at yourself and, and take this in uh, because there's been a bit of a change to your appearance because of the, the facial burn. So I had to have a good look at that and um, take, and it really was quite shocking. My face at the time was extremely swollen and the scars were really prominent and dramatic. And, and I was still waiting for some further sort of plastic procedures in order to, um, should we say, uh, add a bit of a, a tweak here and there, which I've had over the years. I've had some very good surgeons and um, and um, so, yeah, that was a really tough thing for me to, to, to face and to accept. And um, I've had some interesting, um, I guess, um, transition period when I think about, you know, it doesn't come overnight. You know, you have a, a, um, a facial injury, you know, a burns injury in my case and a change of appearance. And of course, we've talked about acceptance and how that that takes time. And, and over the years, you know, I've been conscious of the reaction with others and, um, for example, facing the general public. And I found it quite hard. I did um, in the early days, you know, going out um, and I just, you know, I felt that I couldn't really go out and face the world. It was quite difficult. Um, and then I just eventually, I, again, I started to take those tentative steps, if you like, baby steps towards coping and, and facing the public again. And I guess this is interesting. It, 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 it's um, something that I've often thought about and it harks back, I think, to something similar. Um, you may have heard of the guinea pig survivors, the guinea pig club from World War II. And there was a lot of pilots that got damaged and burns specifically. And they were treated in the Second World War by a surgeon called Sir Archibald McKindo down at East Grinstead Hospital in Surrey. And, um, and many pilots, I mean, back in the heyday, there was some 650 guinea pigs. I did my research on this and I even met a few of these guys back in the day, but, um, um, there's very few left now, sadly, because they, 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 they moved on in years. And, um, and again, the acceptance things and, and what McKindo did, the surgeon back then was that not only did he treat the patients in the medical sense, in the burns unit, in, in the hospital at the time. And he did skin grafts and pedicle skin flaps and all the rest of it and all these pioneering treatments. But more to the point, he used to pretty much try to um, help them um, to liaise perhaps with a, with a nurse or a, a member of the medical staffing. And they would go out into the community and they would sort of walk around the, um, the local town in East Grinstead. I mean, bearing in mind this was back in the sort of, uh, you know, the latter stages of, of World War Two. So that era and and they would obviously be dressed up you know bandages and clothing and they'd get their uniforms back on so they had some dignity and they walked them out in the local community like perhaps arm in arm with a nurse or, or, or a medical assistant and um and um yeah they would they would face the public because the public um you know it was felt that the public should see them it would be good for the patient so in this case the the former um, RAF pilots and, and in, in, um, conversely, it would be good for the public to see them and therefore, you know, it would, it would perhaps reduce the stigma. So I thought about this and I thought about this from my own, in my own case, and I found it quite tough and I would perhaps go with a family member, you know, my mom or perhaps, uh, my brother or my sister or my, my father and, and go for a walk. This was in the early years. And just to get me used to walking, really, just so I had a bit of company. And I'd also, you know, perhaps, uh, um, you know, have what I felt was a bit of a disguise. You know, I'd perhaps wear my, my, my hat, um, you know, to sort of cover up a little bit, but also just to give myself a bit of protection from the sun in my case. Uh, so maybe some dark sunglasses. And then I guess gradual exposure. So being outdoors in general, over the course of time, I got used to it. 
you know and then I, I i talked about how i um i managed to rehabilitate myself and did a lot of walking and then the block got bigger and i pushed the distance on that so within about probably i would suggest about three and a half years after my incident i built up my strength and stamina and then i guess i had to pinch myself because suddenly a friend got me a place on the um on the london marathon and then suddenly i'm facing huge crowds you know like thirty-five thousand people in in the not only all the all the fellow runners and and athletes you know i was just power walking because i was still bandages at the time you know and still a little bit um if you like in clinical in clinical need in that respect um, i still wasn't fully healed um so i was facing not only my fellow contestants on on on, on the um on the marathon but i was also facing you know tremendous crowds everywhere you turned every street corner you turned in 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 greater london in in central london and the atmosphere was electric and that helped me a lot you know facing those big crowds and because that was me you know that was me sort of the the raw face at the time of of jamie hull and facing those crowds but having that exposure uh, and actually for me pushing myself out there and and um and you know I guess not being afraid, having the courage to to step step out in that respect was was an important part of my my healing process and and the acceptance. It's amazing because you've clearly done exposure therapy, and you know initially it was like a few people seeing you, and then you kind of put yourself on a stage essentially because of the volumes of people, and that must have really desensitised you to the reactions that you get. And whereas where now I, I get a sense that it it must not really trouble you that much if you see someone kind of reacting badly no i mean it doesn't really now i mean uh, let's let's be honest i mean here i am now i'm i'm 13 years pretty much just uh, you know over 13 years in fact now since the incident and um i've had a lot of time to heal you know the old saying time is a great healer so my body is infinitely healthier and and more healed in comparison to what it was and um and with that, the you know, I would strongly suggest that the mind has also accepted far more so, and 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 the mind has healed to a great extent because with the trauma to the body came that kind of knock-on psychological trauma to the mind, which took a long time to heal. So with the passing of time, I'm feeling a lot happier and perkier in myself. That goes without saying. But what I will say is that obviously, you know, um, it was such a tremendous. Um, magnitude of 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 burns injury with some real kind of uh if you like um appearance changing physical scarring and that will never really leave me i'm always going to be that guy um and so therefore people will see me in the street and um, perhaps recognize me for that and and i've learned to accept that you know that i look a little bit different and that i need to that's important that i accept that um because i wouldn't want to carry the stigma in my mind that oh i look different and therefore everybody sees me different and therefore that's a problem for me it's important that i address this I, I i did address rather in the past tense so i addressed the stigma in my mind and i was able to accept that that i look different and accept that people therefore perhaps react to me a little bit different and then but i understand that yes i look different but mainly i understand that people uh, react because the human nature thing is that they're just naturally a bit curious as in they will perhaps um, subconsciously question oh i wonder what happened to that guy clearly something happened to him i wonder what happened to him so i understand there's generally that curiosity about it um and i guess um you know uh, i i'm you know i got to a stage where i in terms of like post um injury with all the surgeries i got to a point where i was happy with with my appearance and um and that you know um the acceptance was there and that i was willing to live with it and i was willing to you know on a day to day basis i was willing to step out in life and and more to the point this is more to the point i was able to grab the horns and get on with life and take the opportunities and that's really what the most important thing is not to appearance hold me back Tell me about the, the the grabbing grabbing the bull by the horns and getting on with it, getting on with life, because that 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 to me tells me that you started living life again at that point. Okay, so I I did um, I did I did start to live my life, um, 
and I, I think early on, for, for me especially, it was it was really somewhere deep down. It was very important for me. I've mentioned, you know, to get back to active health. Very, very important for me to do that. And with that sort of level of active health, you know, I'm talking about just going out for the simple pleasures in life, like a, a short daily walk. With that came growth and development in my mind in the psychological sense. So it improved my my sense of well-being, it improved my sense of identity and who I who I now was. And um and and then that 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 kind of growth and development within me enabled me to see the future more and, and actually start to make plans, quite frankly. And then I was able to to to, to decide, okay, well uh, if I'm actually managing to go out for a short daily walk, what else can I do? And so I then started to set about challenging myself in all sorts of ways. Uh, I'd probably bore you senseless if I whittled on about um, all the different opportunities and um, and the sort of challenges that I've I've kind of been involved in over the years. But there's been all kinds of things. Just to give you a few uh, short examples, I ended up going on to do three marathons in London, New York, and then London. I ended up doing Race Across America on a push bike and cycling some 3,000 plus miles from West Coast to East Coast USA, um, albeit with a, a big support crew uh, with the Help Heroes charity. And, and that was um, something, you know, that really changed my whole outlook really at the time and realized that actually what, what I'm capable of with the right drive and determination, you know, what, what we can be capable of once again. And then, you know, I've done all sorts of things. I've climbed mountains. I've led expeditions for young young teams for, for schools and things like that. Um, I've, I've done uh, a lot of scuba diving. Scuba diving was an old hobby and I never thought I'd dive again because I was worried about the, perhaps the salt water damage to my skin. And actually um, uh, to my joy, I got back in the water uh, about five years after my injury. Uh, it took me about five years to go back in and, and scuba dive again, but um, I managed to do that and I loved every minute of it. Um, and I then sort of developed myself a bit more with diving and sort of pursued qualifications. Um, I, I retrained as a, as a pilot and I, um, I feel very blessed uh, that I've been able to, to kind of move on in life and, um, and ultimately one kind of class myself as a, a true survivor in every sense of the word. And I, but I think two, and perhaps quite importantly, I've been able to, to share that sentiment and to share a little bit of wisdom with um, with people out there that perhaps realise that, uh, um, or perhaps are a little bit unsure. More to the point, that um, you know, when 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 tough things happen in life, that um, you know, there, there can be a way back. And um, I think that's right it's such an important message that you're able to share with people because people really struggle with acceptance. Something happens in their life, and they just cannot come to accept it whatever that thing might be and for people to hear the story of someone who actually has gotten through such a tremendous journey and actually found that acceptance is is amazing to give people hope that actually they can get there it's very interesting because you were a very active man before and what started to kind of when you started living life again it was all about kind of doing the things that you enjoyed previously yeah i tried to I tried to follow up with, you know, some of my former interests and um, and and maybe develop some new interests as well. It was important. Um, I felt that, that, you know, in truth, I wasn't the same guy, yeah. and I never quite would be the same guy. I never would be the same. Um, I wouldn't have the same level of um, full function and athleticism that I formerly had. Yeah. So it, it cost me my career, if you like. The accident was was that severe. Yeah. In the operational sense, it cost me my career with with the armed forces and. and and so on but therefore it was it was really quite important for me as i mentioned the goals to set new goals and and to be able to to find interests that i could follow that i could pursue based on on the body so i had i now had a, a level of um um you know if you like um some, 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 I was held back with some, I mentioned the nerve damage in my lower limbs and that held me back a, a small amount. So I felt, okay, what can I do? How can I focus on that? How can I, how can I sort of test myself? And that, that's exactly what I did. You know, I, you know, from walking, I decided to just 
to gently start trying to ride a push bike again. Yeah, and I was so scared at the time because the level of damage that my, my legs had sustained that um, I never thought I'd be able to ride a push bike, you know, a two wheel yeah. push bike, certainly not without stabilizers, yeah. which seems crazy for a grown man to ride a push bike with stabilizers. Yeah. But I thought, I know, I'll get a tricycle. So I did exactly that. I actually bought a trike, you know, yeah. one of these three wheelers. Yeah. So I was worried about the stability. And then when I found out that I could ride the, the trike and it was all good, I then took the courage to ride a two wheel push bike again. And, and then, you know, probably realistically, you know, it was, it was a further few years before I went on to do race across America yeah. on the two wheel sort of upright road bike. Yeah. Uh, but that, that was a lot of goal setting to yeah. get there. I really like how you broke down your goals and just took it like one step at a time. What was it like for you when you started flying again? It was, um, yeah, I, I, it was, I felt that it was important not to, uh, not to let that, that dream just kind of fade out and die away just because I had an incident in um, yeah. Florida that I described. So um, I applied for a couple of scholarships. You don't always get lucky. That's, that's life. And, and um, there was um, the first the initial scholarship I didn't get. And there was a lot of competition and a lot of very um, eligible individuals going for that. So, you know, you, 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 you take things on the chin and, and you move on in life. Um, and then I never, I didn't, initially, I didn't consider that I would apply for another scholarship. I thought, oh, perhaps, you know, I won't fly again and that would be me. And then later on, an opportunity come up to um, subscribe and apply to another scholarship, which I did. And, um, and this time I got um, fortunate with the process and I went, I got shortlisted. And I got a I got a scholarship, but this time it was a little bit different. It was um, so the offering was to um, to learn to fly a hot air balloon, and I did the I did my training in Italy, and that was a lot of fun, uh, quite nerve wracking, especially when I got to the stage where post uh, um, instruction, uh, yeah. where I was going solo for the first time in, in Italian airspace. Yeah. And, um, and it's difficult to understand the accents as well on the radio out there because they've got this kind of you know strong Italian accent. Um, but uh, yeah, a little bit nerve wracking. But once I I sort of found myself, um, you know, once I kind of relaxed a little bit and kind of got into it, and I'm speaking to the you know air traffic and I'm speaking to a kind of a support crew on the ground with a uh, uh, with a handheld system. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, and yeah. um, and that gave me a, a great deal of. Uh, it sort of gave me a real kind of boost to self-esteem, you know, you could say. And, and it was lovely for me to get back in the air. And, yeah, um, I really so, love that you got yeah. back in the air again, because if someone is, if someone walks down an alleyway and they get mugged, they will often never walk down alleyways ever again, because they are just too, too traumatized. They deem that as unsafe, and it's a very natural thing to try and keep yourself safe and to overcome trauma it's, it's amazing when people actually put themselves back in those situations where they had such a horrific experience um so i think it's really remarkable that you did that and that you set it as a goal and that you knew that it, it would be very fulfilling for you if you managed to accomplish that yeah for, for sure uh, i guess there's an old saying isn't there it's about um you know if at first you don't succeed um perhaps consider getting back on the bike and, um, you know, and uh, and that was how it was in my case. I thought uh, perhaps, um, you know, and, and I'd, yeah, I'd done a bit of it. I've done a bit of light aircraft as well in before the balloon even. So I, I got back into a, into a fixed wing light aircraft quite early on uh, over sort of UK airspace uh, and done bits and pieces. Did you uh, feel extremely anxious initially because of everything that you'd been through? Oh, absolutely. I did. There's no doubt about that. I was very... Um, um, you know, it was, it, it was, I had a lot of trepidation going on in my mind because um, you think, you, you think the worst, like, what if it happens again? Yeah. You know, a similar sort of um, technical issue sort of flares up with an aircraft again or whatever. And how am I going to cope with this? And yeah. I'm not sure if I would even have the body now or the legs to do what I did before. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I might be kind of, that's, you know, you think the worst, you know, yeah, but, definitely. Um, but I think the important thing is in particular, um, not to lose sight of, of uh, perhaps dreams in life. Um, yeah. You know, we're here only a relatively short time um, and it's no dress rehearsal. Yeah. So I think while there is will and while there is kind of that 
that sentiment and that heart going on within an individual to achieve something in life, whatever it might be, yeah. you know, whether it's kind of, uh, you know, learning to, to, um, to get to the tiddlywinks final or indeed learning to climb a, a technical mountain face, you know, in, in, in stark contrast. I think it's important that, um, that we don't lose sight of perhaps goals and objectives. Yeah. And indeed, um, you know, that's what drives us as all as you know, unique sort of individual human beings. Yeah. Jamie, I'm quite blown away by the psychological progress that you've made. And, you know, I really think that people will, will take a lot from that, um, particularly people who have had traumatic struggles of whatever kind. Um, you know, I think that people can really relate to this in, in so many different ways. Um, and I think that part has been just so empowering to, to listen to and will be empowering for our viewers. Um, where can people find out more information about you or anything that you'd like to promote? Um, I'll be doing a lot, um, you know, in terms of um, general kind of uh, media sense from time to time. So, and I actually have, um, so I have a website as well, which people can look at, which is um, just simply uh, www.jamiehull.co.uk. And then also um, later on next year in the spring, um, I'm looking at releasing my story in publication. So you'll, you'll learn more about that in due course.